Okay, inshallah. As I've said, this will be very informal. So it will be more of a chat than a, a lesson. I will advise that everyone attends every day on time to the end of this, of this course, of these sessions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed, us, blessed you all, all of you brothers and sisters, with one of the greatest forms of ibadat, which is hajj. The, in, a, in a very well-known hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Bunya al-Islam wa ala khams. That Islam has been the foundation of Islam. Or Islam, the deen of Islam, rests on, on five things. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned those five things. And one of those five things, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, is hajj. And we all know, we all know those five things. That uh, shahadati an la ilaha illallah wa iqamati salah wa ita'i zakah wa hajj al-bayt wa sawmi ramadhan aw kama qala al-nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That these are the five things upon which Islam rests or Islam has been built or Islam is on these five things which we, we say are the five pillars of Islam. To, to bear witness or to testify to the fact that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship except Allah. Wa iqam is salah, and to establish five times salah. Wa ita is zakah, and to give zakat once a year according to its set conditions. Wa sawmi Ramadan, and to fast during the month of Ramadan. Wa hajj al bayt, and to do the hajj of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم in the order in which the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has said this. Allah سبحانه وتعالى takes to his house whomsoever whomsoever he wills, and the 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 حج حج of the house of Allah سبحانه وتعالى is a duty that we owe to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. In the Quran, the verses that are recited before you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al Hajju Ashuru Ma'lumat, Faman Farada fi Hinna al Hajja, Fala Rafatha, Wala Fusuka, Wala Jidala fi al Hajj. That the months of Hajj, the months of Hajj are known. Ashurun Ma'lumat, the unknown months. And those months are the months of Shawwal and Dhulqa'da and the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. These are the months of Hajj. Shawwal, from the beginning of Shawwal, the season of Hajj, the Muslim of Hajj begins. Shawwal, Dhulqa'da and the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجَّ فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, And he who, he who makes fard upon himself, hajj, he, in other words, he who dons the ihram, who, who, who enters a state of ihram, then he has made hajj fard upon himself. Then for that person, فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجْ Then there is no رَفَث, there is no فُسُوق, no جِدَال. رَفَث, the ulama have given, uh, interpreted the word رَفَث here as anything which is obscene or indecent, be that speech or action of a sexual nature. So there is no رَفَث in a state of ihram. Inshallah there will be more explanations given further on. وَلَا فُسُوق And there will be no transgression. There is no transgression in a state of ihram. Any wrongdoing, guna, sinning. Wala jidal, and there's no argumentation disputing in a state of hajj, in a state of ihram. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ And whatever good you do, Allah knows. وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى وَاتَّقُونِ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ and it goes on, inshallah, I will, exp- I will mention some of these points of these verses further on, inshallah. 
there was a year, I think, uh, three years ago, when I went through this section of Surah Al-Baqarah, quite a long section here, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks about Hajj and some of the ahkam, some of the laws of Hajj. It's quite detailed. And uh, there was a year, I think three, three or four years ago, when I went through the tafsir of these verses, for which we don't have time now. But inshallah, I will be mentioning some of these points and also some of the ayat, the verses from this section of Surah Al-Baqarah, which relate to Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا That, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ That men owe it as a duty. Men owe it as a duty to Allah, Hajjul Bayt, Hajj of the house of Allah. So Hajj really is a duty that we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man istata'a ilayhi sabila. For, for him, it's a duty upon him who has the istita'a, he has the capability of reaching the house, house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whoever has the capability, and this capability means financial capability, and we'll look at the conditions tomorrow, inshallah, from Mullah Ali Qadir Rahimullah Ta'ala's book. He who has the financial capability, has the physical health capability of reaching the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that person owes it as a duty, it's a duty upon him. He, he owes it to Allah. Walillah, in Allah ke liye, is upon, upon he, that person who has the means, the capability of doing so, of reaching the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is, he owes it, he owes the hajj of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the fact that all of us here are going, inshallah, will be going for hajj, is a clear indication that we are able to go to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the case of most of you here, with the exception of, Abayis of there, the rest of you will be going for the first time, I think. Yes, is that correct? You're going for the first time. So, Hajj has become, in the case of most of you, I am assuming that Hajj has become farz upon you. It has become obligatory upon you due to which you are going to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And clearly in terms, your, in terms of your health, in terms of your body, physically, I can see that you will not have, you don't have any problems because you, you all look fit and healthy and young, inshallah, so you can, you can make it. Financially, inshallah, you are going to, for hajj because you can financially manage to go there. The conditions we'll look at, inshallah, tomorrow in, in a bit detail, more detail tomorrow, inshallah. So it's a duty that we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And <coughs> Shah Waliullah rahimahullah ta'ala has mentioned quite a few things regarding Hajj, the spiritual side of Hajj, the spiritual, the spiritual aspect of Hajj. He says that the benefits of the hidden dimensions of Hajj, uh, he says that one of the, the, the hidden dimensions of the wisdoms be, behind Hajj, he says, is Ta'azimul Bayt. To do ta'azim of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to venerate, to honor the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the, the veneration of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the cubic house, the, the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is min sha'airillah, is from the sha'air, it is from the emblems or the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to venerate the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we go to the Kaaba, to the Baytullah, and when you do the tawaf of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're venerating it, you're doing ta'azim, you're honoring the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then to honor the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? We, d we can't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't go to Him. We can't kiss the feet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, because Allah laysa ka mithlihi shay, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like anything. Walam yakullahu kufuan ahad, that there is no one like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So instead what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya has done is that he has given us his house, the Baytullah, the Kaaba, which is a symbol, which is an emblem. So when we go to the Kaaba and we do the tawaf of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thereby we're venerating the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, honoring the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in, in, in reality we are venerating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hajj, out of the, the, the four, four pillars of Islam that have been mentioned in the hadith that I mentioned to you by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, out of the four pillars, Shahadati Allah ilaha illallah is Iman. And then after that he mentioned alayhi salam four things. Iqami salah wa ita is zakah wa sawmi ramadhan wa hajj al-bayt. Awkamaqal. Salat, the first pillar, to pray five times a day. What do we need for that? We need just our body. That's all. You don't need money to pray five times a day, do you? You don't need money to pray five times a day. You need to have your body. And with your body, you pray your five times salat. So, fasting, what do you need? You need just your body, you need yourself, just your body in order to fast during the month of Ramadan. Zakat, for that you need, not your body, but rather you need, more importantly, you need, you need money. So if a person has a certain, the, the nisab, zakatable amount of surplus wealth, of savings, then that person has to give 2.5% or 140th portion of that to the fuqara, to the masakin to the poor people, destitute people, as zakat. So for that you need money. So for salat, five times prayer, and for fasting of Ramadan, you need, you physically have to do it with your body. With zakat, you need to do it with your money. So the first two forms of ibadat, the first two pillars after the four pillars, are pillars which, which necessitate your body. The third pillar mentioned here, which is zakat, is one which requires your money. It's a financial. One is those, the, so the first two are physical forms of ibadat, bodily ibadat, and zakat is a financial form of ibadah. And the fourth one, hajj, is a unique type of ibadah, in that it is a combination of bodily as well as financial. Okay? It's a combination of both. This is why Hajj is so unique. It's one of the, it's a very unique form of ibadah. Because first of all, in order to do Hajj, you will need your body. You need your health. Without health, without the physical capability of going for Hajj, for, for going to Makkah, Mukarramah, going to Mina, going to Arafat, going to Muzdalifa, you need your body. Without that, you can't do Hajj. And not just your body, but you need to have the health. Your body, you need to have the strength in your body to do all those things, which are quite strenuous, laborious. You need to have the strength. Otherwise, you will not be able to do it. And we'll look at some of the details of that, inshallah, further on. For zakat, so for hajj. And the other thing you need for hajj is everyone, even those who live in, in Saudi Arabia, those who live even in Makkah, Mukarramah, will need some form of finances. They need at least something. Even those who live, live in Makkah, Mukarramah, for whom Hajj is just outside their city, even they need some money. It may not be a, a, a huge amount of money that they need, but they need some money. Whereas in our case here, most of you would be paying, I, my guess is, judging by my inquiries that I've made with some uh, travel agencies, is Hajj tour operators, you, all of you would, will be paying okay, uh, around 4,000 to 5,000 pounds per person. Is that not right, roughly? Maybe if you've got a good cheap package, you may be paying less than £4,000, maybe. But r roughly nowadays, the average cost of Hajj from this country in the UK is £4,000 to £5,000, depending on what you're getting in that, with that money, where you're going to be staying, how long you're going to be staying, what facilities they're going to be providing for you. Okay, so this is how much you're going to pay. So you need your body... You need your physical, you need your health, and secondly, you need the finances, you need the money. So Hajj is a combination between both types of ibadat. You need both things. So when you go to for Hajj, then you're doing the ta'zim, you're honoring, venerating the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by doing so, 
Imam Shah Waliullah Ta'ala is saying, then you are in, you're in, actually in reality, you're venerating, you're doing, showing ta'azim to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the house there in his place. So when you're venerating the house of Allah, you're venerating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also he says that when people go, when the hujjaj converge, when they all assemble, they gather, congregate in the maqamat muqaddasa, in the holy sites, in Makkah Mukarrama, and outside of Makkah Mukarrama, then what they're doing is, he's saying that, that they are, this, this, he's saying that this is a religious convergence, this is a religious gathering. It's a gathering of the entire ummah, or representatives from the ummah. It's the gathering of the nation of Islam, the nation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says that every nation, Imam Shawulullah Rahimullah Ta'ala says that every state or every nation, every people, they have an ijtima, they have a gathering. Wherein the Akasi, the lowly people of that nation, intermingle with the uh, 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 sorry, the Akasi, the people who are furthest, the people who are furthest Akasi, they intermingle, they mix, they socialize with the Adani, those are closest. In other words, people from every region, they all gather. So, people have festivals. Nowadays, we know that people in communities or nations, they have festivals wherein all the people, or they have a national holiday, wherein everyone rejoices and everyone gets together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this deen of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an ihtifal or ijtima' He has given us this hajj. Wherein every, the entire representatives from every part of this ummah, they all converge, they all get together, they gather on the occasion of hajj. And he says so that, لِيَعْرِفَ فِيهِمْ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا So that each one, they get to know one another. And they will learn the ahkam of the of the deen. They will learn the commandments of the deen from 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 each other. And they will wa yu'azimu sha'airaha. And they will venerate the emblems or the symbols of the deen of Islam together. And he says, wal hajju ardatul muslimin. And hajj is the convergence, the presentation of the Muslims. Hajj is, inshallah, when you go, then you all know from the internet, from the TV. That this is what happens, and you will see that this is magical. And this is why you must have heard and, and, and read non Muslims when they go for Hajj, they experience it and they feel it more than we do, those who have been born into Islam. Non Muslims who have made the sacrifice, when they go for Hajj, it has a tremendous effect on them when they go for Hajj. Because when they see people of every nation, what 2.5 to 3 million people, if that's the correct number, that, that go for Hajj each year. 2.5 to 3 million people, Muslims of 3.5 million, whatever is the correct uh, amount of number of people, they all gather in Makkah, Mukarrama, they all gather in Mina, they all gather in Arafat, in Muzdalifa, and most of them also then move, go, travel on to Medina, Munawwara, all at the same time, more or less, at least during the six days of, the five days of Hajj, or the six days of Hajj, the, 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 third, the sixth day being an optional day, during those five or six days of Hajj, everyone are gathering in those same places, all at the same time. And the brotherhood that you see there, that you will inshallah will experience there, between all the people, the Hujjaj is amazing. And that, for a person, that is enough to convince them of the, the Haqqaniyyah, the truth of Islam. It is so, so, so beautiful when you go there inshallah, when you see this and experience it yourself. So Imam Waliullah rahimahullah ta'ala says that this is the gathering and this is the convergence and the presentation of the Muslims as an ummah, as one unified body. And he says that this is also a manifestation of the strength and might, the glory of this ummah, of the Muslims. Wherein, he says, the armies of Islam also converge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَا He says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat number 125, and when we made the house مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ 
We made the house, meaning the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mathaba. Mathaba means marja, a, a place wherein people return, where people gather. A, a place where people return. So we made the house a place to where people return. Wa amna and a place of safety and security. Also he says, Hajj, one of the other, uh, uh, another inner dimension of wisdom behind Hajj, he says, is so that people will acquire that which has been passed on from Sayyidina Ibrahim and Sayyidina Ismail alayhim as salam. That people will acquire, they will obtain the legacy. People will, uh, will attain or obtain the legacy left behind by Sayyidina Ibrahim and his son Sayyidina Ismail alayhim as salam. Because they are the, the two imams of this millah. They are the two imams of the, of the nation of Islam, of the ummah of Islam. They are the main imams, they are the main leaders of this, the fathers of this, of this nation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Millata abikum Ibrahim. This is the millah, the nation of your father Ibrahim. So Ibrahim alayhi salam in reality who also who also biologically is one of the ancestors of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is all, he is the spiritual father of all the mu'minun he is the spiritual father of all the believers And then Imam Waliullah rahimahullah ta'ala he goes on he elaborates on this which inshallah I will just omit He says also people, when people go for Hajj, then the, the general Muslims and the special Muslims, the Awam and the Khawas, the special Muslims and the general, the masses, the general Muslims, they all intermingle, they all mix and they all... Uh, they all show kindness towards each other. They also show kindness towards each other and brotherhood. For example, he says when people descend on Mina, when people descend on Mina and then when they spend the night in Muzdalifa, he's saying that people are all mixing and they're, they're all showing their, their kindness and the brother, brotherly love towards each other. If this had not happened, then this, this such an occasion is not a, is not found anywhere else. Even in Islam, such an occasion, such occasions are not found anywhere else, on an annual basis, where wherein people, the special Muslims, special either in their deen or special from a worldly sense, okay, and. The, your general Muslims, they all mix and they all show affection towards each other. They all show brotherhood towards each other and they're all equal. When you will go for Hajj, you will see that they are, everyone is equal and you will not be able to tell that he is a millionaire and you're the opposite. You will not be able to tell. Everyone will look the same because every person, all the men have to don two sheets of cloth which we call, we call the ihram, when they enter the state of ihram, then you will not, everyone will have very simple, even the kings, if they go for hajj, or they go for umrah, then they have to also wear what, what you have to wear. And they can't say, I'm a king, so I have to have something very distinct, mumtaz. My clothing has to be a very royal clothing. My attire has to be such that people, when they see me, they will know that I'm the king of such and such a country. If they did that, then they, the hajj will, they will, they will spoil their hajj. They may have, they'll have to give them a penalty of, of, sacrifice, of sacrificing an animal for that. So everyone looks the same and everyone also, everyone treat each other the same when they go for Hajj. The A'mal that you will do, the actions, the A'mal that you, the, the rituals of Hajj are such that the rituals themselves, the A'mal themselves, they announce that the dua, the, the one who is carrying out those rituals, is a muwahid, is a person of tawheed. He believes in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he follows al-haq, he follows the truth. 
And he follows the, the uh, Al-Millatul Hanifiyya, left by Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he is someone who is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon this ummah, upon this millah. For example, when a person, a haji, does sa'i between Safa and Marwa, the Mount of Safa and Marwa, then this is an expression of his gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those things which Allah ta'ala has bestowed upon the first part of this millah, which is the family of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. When we do sa'i between Safa and Marwa, what are we doing? We're doing, we are remembering what the wife of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam Hajar radiallahu anha did. We're remembering that because that was so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people of Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic people, before Islam came, the pre-Islamic people also used to do Hajj. They used to also go for pilgrimage to Makkah. They used to also go to Mina and Arafat, etc., and that was also a, a, a core part of their deen, of their religion, the pre-Islamic people. But they had mixed up those practices which were passed on by Sayyiduna from Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam. They had confused those things, those, those practices, those rituals, a'mal, with things of themselves from themselves. They did things which were, ish, which were shirk in the in the hajj for example when they used to go for hajj then they used to venerate the statues of isaf and naila now isaf and naila the tradition is where a boy and a girl a youth and a girl who wallahi billah committed zina in the house of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were turned into stones into statues they were turned into statues. And those statues, all the way to the time of our Prophet wasallam, were kept inside the Baytullah, inside the Kaaba. And when the people of Jahiliya, the pre-Islamic people used to go for Hajj, they used to venerate those two statues. This is how corrupt they had become and how bi'aqal they had become. And they used to do talbiyah for Manat. Manat was one of the, the, the largest idols that they had. Manat, Lat, Uzza, etc. So they used to do talbiyah for them. Just as you will be doing talbiyah, saying talbiyah, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika Laka Labbaik, Inna Alhamda wa Ni'mata Laka wal Mulk, La Sharika Lak. The pre Islamic people of the Jahili period, they used to do talbiyah for those idols when they used to go for Hajj. For example, they used to say in the talbiyah, La Sharika Laka, Illa Sharika and Huwa Lak. Whereas we say, La Sharika Lak. Well, Allah, there is no sharik for you. There is no partner to you for you. They in their talbiyah they used to say la sharika lak. There is no sharik for you. Illa sharik and hua lak. Except for one sharik, one partner who is for you. So th- this was their talbiyah, a corrupt form of tal- talbiyah. Also, when they used to, they used to boast. They had a lot of fakhr. They used to boast. They had so much pride. In Mina, when they, during the days of Mina, when they used to gather and stay in Mina, then they used to gather, they used to have gatherings in Mina, wherein one tribe would, they would boast about their forefathers, the chivalry, the, the courage of the, the bravery of their forefathers. And another tribe, another family or tribe would do the same. And they, they would have, comp- as if they were competing, having competitions regarding how great their forefathers were. And they had these competitions of ash'ar, of poetry, in Mina. This is how they used to spend their time in Mina. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes reference to this in Surah Al-Baqarah in Ayat 200 where he says, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that remember Allah, do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah Yes. فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا When you have completed your manasik, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ When you have completed the rituals of your hajj, the things that you're supposed to be doing, you're required to do in your hajj. When you've done those things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ Then do the dhikr. Remember Allah. كَذِكْرِكُمْ أَبَاءَكُمْ just as, just as the way you used to 
remember your forefathers. Just as the way you used to remember your forefathers, أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرَ Or even more of a zikr than the zikr of your forefathers. So this is a reference to that practice of the Jahili period when the people, when they used to, uh, when they used to spend their time in Mina, then they, each clan or each tribe would boast about their forefathers, that this was our for, these were our forefathers, my dad was like this, my granddad was like this, he was such a great, brave, brave hero, he was a courageous leader, etc., etc. And they used to do this in poetry form. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, do the zikr of Allah. The way you used to do the zikr before Islam, you used to remember your forefathers, do, remember Allah ta'ala in that way, aw ashad the zikr, but rather do it even more. Do the zikr of Allah Ta'ala, engage in the zikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala even more. The Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhum of Medina Munawwara, the Ansar Sahaba, when they learned that Hajj was also an integral part of the Jahili people, the people prior to Islam, then, and also that the people before Islam used to also do the Sa'i between Mount Safa and Mount Marwa, between Safa and Marwa, the Ansar Sahaba radiallahu anhu felt a bit uneasy about it. In other words, they, were, they, they felt, how can we be doing a, a practice which people before us of the Jahili period also used to do? So they felt this in their heart, that how can we be running from Mount Safa to Mount, Mount Marwa and back seven times? How, should, how can we be doing the same as the people did before Islam? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed it by saying, Inna Safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. That indeed Safa, Mount Safa and Marwa are from the emblems, from the symbols of Allah. They are from the emblems, the symbols of Allah. So, فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اِعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا Whoever performs Hajj, or carries out Umrah, performs Umrah, then there's no problem in doing Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. In other words, don't worry about it. Because this is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember what Imam Waliullah rahmatullahi is saying. He's saying that the Jahili people, people prior to Islam also, Hajj was also a very integral core part of their religions. Even the Mushrikun polytheists used to go for Hajj. But as he said, they did some things they had retained from the teachings of Sayyiduna Ibrahim Khalilullah and his son Sayyiduna Ismail alayhima salam and other things they had corrupted and they, they, they had invented, innovated of themselves. So the Sai between Safa and Marwa was one of the teachings that they had inherited in its pristine condition from Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. The Sahaba did not know this, therefore the Ansar Sahaba felt a bit uneasy about it. How can we be doing something that the Jahili people used to do before Islam? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put their hearts to rest by saying that, that Safa, Safa and Marwa min sha'airillah, they are from the emblems of Allah, they are from the symbols of Allah. So whoever goes for Hajj or does Umrah, then there's no fala junah alayhi ya tawafa there's no junah, there's no problem with him, there's no there's no problem in doing Sa'i between Safa and Marwa. There are, there are other things he says that they used to do Qiyasat, Fasida, that they had, they had corrupt analogies they had, that they had um, thought of. For example, one of their beliefs was prayer to Islam, was that if a person is in a state of Ihram, then he is not allowed to enter a house, any dwelling from his door. If you're in a state of ihram, then you're not, you're, then you're not allowed to enter a, pl- a house or a dwelling through the doors. So they would make a way through the walls or something, or through the, from the sides, through the windows. So you're not allowed to enter a, ru- a house through the doors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed this in the Qur'an by saying, وَلَيْسَ الْبِرُّ بِأَن تَأْتُوا الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهَا okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that piety... Neki, piety is not in you entering a house from its rear. Okay? Don't think that if you enter the house, a house from the rear or from the sides, instead of, instead of the front door, then that is piety. That is not piety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that, that's something that they made up. They thought and they made up. 
So whatever thing does not belong to the deen should not be entered into the deen. Because that is called bid'ah, innovation in the deen. Another thing that they used to believe which was false, was that they used to believe that a person is not allowed to trade during the season of Hajj, during the days of Hajj. A person is not allowed to trade. So if a person, if you, when you go for Hajj, then you're not allowed to trade, you're not allowed to do business in Hajj. That was one of their beliefs, that, they, that, that would spoil your Hajj. That will... تُخِلُّ بِإِخْلَاسِ الْعَمَلِ لِلَّهِ That it will, it will put a khalal in your ikhlas for Allah. That it, it will cause a, a blemish, it will put a blemish or a fault in your sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you've gone for hajj for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to please Allah ta'ala. But if you whilst over there in hajj, if you do business there, buying and selling, trade, then there is to believe then that will spoil the sincerity that you had. But the deen of Islam is a, a balanced deen. It's a moderate deen, a deen of moderation. Okay? It's between both extremes. The extreme that was found in the deen of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam and the, the extreme that was found in the deen of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam and the leniency that was found in the deen of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. So this, the deen of Islam, the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is between both extremes. It's a balanced deen. Rabbana, what do you say? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana. This is the teaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us in the Quran to ask Allah ta'ala the good of this dunya and the good of the akhirah. To have both and not just go for the akhirah and neglect your dunya. So this is beautifully shown here in this teaching of, 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 the, of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the Qur'an, that when we go for hajj, then a person is allowed to trade in hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this by saying, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ that, when, that there's no problem on, on you. There's no problem. Okay? There's no problem in you seeking from the bounties of your Rabb. In other words, when you, and this is in the context of Hajj. When you go for Hajj, whilst over there in Hajj, if you're seeking the bounties of Allah Ta'ala, the fuzzle of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, meaning the worldly, worldly gains, merchandise, worldly merchandise, goods, Allah <coughs> Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying there's no problem in doing so. Okay? However, for us it is best not to go with that intention. If a person does go, if a person is a business, person of business, and... His business is such that he can do good business in Makkah Mukarrama, in Medina Munawwara, or if he takes a, a day out, a trip down to, uh, to Jeddah, and he can do whatever business, he can do good business there. Or he can, he can set up a business there, or a partnership there, or whatever. If the person has that intention with the intention of his hajj, then there is no problem in doing so. However, it is best, our ulama will say it is best that when you go for hajj, you do not have that. Just have your intention solely, solely khalisan li wajhillah for only and only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't have those, those intentions. When a lot of people do a lot of shopping there. Now is there anything wrong in doing shopping? There's nothing wrong in shopping. A lot of sisters do their gold shopping there. And they also take orders from other sisters, from relatives to buy gold for them from whilst they're there. Because gold is of a, probably a better quality and maybe it's, it's all, clearly it's cheaper over there. People also take orders to buy Rolex watches for their relatives. Brothers I traveled with, they were every night out and about in, a, in the Haram Shari vein. Nowadays, especially Makkah Mukarrama, is, is surrounded by shopping malls, western style shopping malls. Inshallah, I'll speak about this in more detail at the right time, inshallah, during the course of these lessons. So a lot of people, they go there and when they see these shopping malls and sisters have the freedom of going to these shops. Going to these shopping malls will benefit you in no way. In fact, it is detrimental to your hajj. Your hajj will not be invalid if you visit the shopping malls. But however, the point is, as the Quran has given us permission to do even business there, the Quran has given us, the Quran has refuted rebutted the belief of the jahili pre-Islamic people that if you go for hajj, you're not allowed to do any business. 
Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an has, has said, لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَنْ تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ There's no problem. It's me koi muzaqa ni koi maslani. Allah Ta'ala is saying that you seek from the fuzzle of Allah Ta'ala, from the bounties of Allah. Which means we can do our shopping once we're over there. But what happens, and often what happens to us, and I've seen this on both my trips there, is that people just, bilkul, they become behush. A lot of people, and they're out and about shopping all day, just wandering about in the shopping malls, and they take a lot of orders. Brothers also do the same, sisters do the same, especially jewelry orders from relatives, family and relatives who buy gold, necklaces, they start and the other. Don't do that. Yes, when you've finished everything, when you've finished your hajj, before you move, most people will be going to Makkah Mukarramah first, and then after they've completed the Hajj, they'll be traveling to Medina Munawwara. When you've completed everything, then just leave half a day or a few hours in which either in Makkah Mukarrama or in Medina Munawwara, just before you return flight back home, in, when you will be buying some gifts for your close relatives. You don't have to make a long list of all your you know, full kumba. Your whole kumba, everyone in your khandan, every distant relative and you have to buy. Some people do this. I was with people, even my family members made a long list of everyone in my massive family. And now we, if we buy something for this family, for this lady, then the other lady will become displeased. Yes, angry. And if you buy clothes for so and so children, then the other person will become angry and displeased, upset that we haven't bought anything for them. If you... If you fall into this chakkar, then that's it. You'll, be, you'll just go majnoon. This is why the best thing to do is, and I've heard Sheikh Salim Dorasa Muddazilum say, that he says that don't do any shopping. The best thing that you can do is, do, the best gift is dua. Because the hajj is according to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the dua of the hujjaj is maqbool. And there's a hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that when you meet the hujjaj, the hajjis, when you meet the hajjis, then ask them to seek forgiveness for, for you from Allah Ta'ala and ask them for dua for you before they, they, they reach their houses. That's the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning of a hadith, that when you meet the hujjaj, the hajjis on the way, on, on their return, when you meet the hujjaj, then ask them to do dua for you, to ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive you and ask them to do dua for you before they reach their homes. Because... The Prophet, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that Raja'aka yawma waladatu ummuhu. He who does hajj of, hajj of the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he returns, she returns home, ka yawma waladatu ummuhu, completely sinless, bilkul paak saaf, just as he was or she was on the day he or she was given birth to by his, his mother. You're completely sinless. You're, all your sins, all your guna are washed off. So you're, you're masoom. If the hajj does dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the hajj's dua will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're completely pak saf, clean of all guna. That's the best gift that you can bring back for us, which is that you do dua for us in all the holy sites, the sacred places that you'll be visiting. In Makkah, Mukarram, Al-Masjid, Al-Haram, in front of the Kaaba, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Mina, in Arafat, in Muzdalifa, in Medina, Munawwara. These are the best places that, uh, the best places on earth, the best place on, in this dunya is Makkah, Mukarrama. The second best place in, the, in this dunya is Medina, Munawwara. And you'll be going there, you'll be sleep, staying there, you'll be spending your days there. Your dua will be most accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you'll be in a state of ihram for much of your time. You'll be a haji, you'll be a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wafdullah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in a hadith. That you'll be the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your dua is maqbool, your dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't waste your time doing shopping. Yes, do some shopping but moderate shopping. Shopping for you. There is no thing over there that you will find in the shopping malls and markets there, which you will not find in this country. And most of the things are made in China. They're not even, people think that if I get a rumal, I get a jubba, kamis, burqa from Makkah, Mukarrama, it's more holy. But that burqa is, is most probably made in China or somewhere. That topi, that, all the topis that you'll buy there, the cups you'll buy, all of them are made in China. Most goods are made in China over there. 
So you will find all those things in the shops in Leicester, in London, Birmingham and other places. So why waste your time going after these things? If you have to bring, it, bring back some gifts for your loved ones, then just do some moderate shopping, just light shopping and also time your shopping in such a way that shaitan does not make you lose out on the blessings, the barakat, the anwar, the nur of your hajj. Shaitan will try and play games with you throughout your hajj, inshallah, as we shall see. And then he mentions quite a lot of things, very beautiful. There's no time to go into all the details. And each of these points that Shah Wuliullah Ta'ala has mentioned in his book uh, requires explanation and elaboration. Uh, we could spend days on end just looking at what he has mentioned here. He, he says that once the Prophet Sallallahu said, and this is a hadith that has been reported by Imam Muslim Rahimullah Ta'ala in his Sahih, said, Ya ayyuhan nas, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O people, qad furidha alaykum al-hajju fa hujju. O people, hajj has been made obligatory, obligatory upon you. Qad furidha alaykum al-hajj. Hajj has been made further upon you, fa hujju, therefore perform hajj. A person asked, akulla amin ya Rasulullah, every year, O Messenger of Allah, has Hajj been made further upon us every year? Fasakat. The Prophet ﷺ remained quiet. He remained silent. He did not say anything. Hatta qalaha thalathan. The man, the Sahabi, asked the same question three times. Every year, O Messenger of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ remained silent. And he then asked again. So three times. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, La qultu na'am la wajabat wa la mastatatatum. If I had said yes in reply to you that yes every year, then la wajabat, then it would have made would have, it would have been made wajib upon you. It would have been made obligatory upon you to perform Hajj every year. Walla masta ta'atum, and indeed you would not have been able to do it every year. Once also he mentions another hadith that a Sahabi came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and asked. Ayyul A'mali Afdalu Which of the deeds, which deed is the best deed? Which action, which amal is the best amal? The Prophet Sallallahu replied Imanun Billahi wa Rasulih To have Iman in Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Then the person asked Thumma Maza And after Iman, what O Messenger of Allah? He said Al Jihadu Fi Sabilillah to do jihad in the path of Allah. Then the person asked, Thumma Maza. Then what? He said, Hajjun Mabrur. A Mabrur Hajj. Mabrur Hajj, inshallah, I will explain later, has been interpreted in different ways. Generally, the ulama, or you'll see in translations, Hajjun Mabrur is translated or interpreted as Hajj Maqbul. Hajjun Maqbul. A hajj that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or a, a hajj of piety. Mabrur from bir. A hajj that consists of piety, of neki. That's the best deed. So here what he is showing is that in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported by Imam At-Tirmidhi ibn Majah Ahmad al-Malik rahimahullah ta'ala is showing you how great a deed hajj is. Because the question I asked, Ayyul A'mal Yafdalu, what is the best deed, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Iman. Iman is the best deed. Imanun billahi wa rasuli. To have Iman in Allah and His Messenger, in His Rasul. Secondly, then he asked, and what after that? The Prophet ﷺ said, To do jihad, al jihadu fi sabilillah. To strive in the path of Allah, to fight for, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With your, with your life, with your wealth, with your health, with your life. And there's no doubt regarding the, the greatness of this. Then when he asked, what after that, O Prophet of Allah, what is the best deed after that? The Prophet wasallam said, Hajjun Maburur. So this is how great Hajj is. The, the Prophet wasallam said, in a hadith that has been reported by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim, rahimahullah ta'ala, مَنْ حَجَّ لِلَّهِ فَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ رَجَعَكَ يَوْمَ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ I mentioned a part of it before. That whoever performs hajj for the pleasure of Allah, 
Man hajja lillah. Whoever performs hajj for the pleasure of Allah. Walam yafsuk. Lam falam yarfuth walam yafsuk. And he does not commit rafath. He does not in that hajj which he has performed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not commit commit rafath. And what is rafath? Rafath means any form of obscenity, lewdness, anything which of a, is a, of a sexual nature, be that speech or any action, that is called rafath, which normally is permissible between husband and wife, but in a state of ihram, even that is even not permissible between husband and wife to speak, to do, or even ishara to gesture, anything of a sexual nature is forbidden in a state of ihram. So that is called rafath. So he who performs hajj for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, falam yarfuth, he does not commit rafath, walam yafsuq, and he does not commit fisq, transgression, disobedience, guna, sin. What will, what will happen to him? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Raja'a ka yawma waladathu ummuhu. Raja'a ka yawmin waladathu ummuhu. Raja'a ka yawmi waladathu ummuhu. There are three variations uh, in the reading of this. Then he or she will return just in a state similar to the state that he or she was on the day his, his or her mother gave birth to him. They will be completely wiped out. All the sins will be, would have been forgiven due to the, the barakat of this hajj. Another uh, <coughs> well-known hadith, Al-Umratu ila al-Umrati kafaratun nima baynahuma. Wal-Hajju al-Mabrur laysa lahu jazaun illa al-Jannah. An Umrah, an Umrah to another Umrah, kafaratun nima baynahuma. When a person performs an Umrah, when a person performs an Umrah, and then after, later, he performs another Umrah, at some other time, then whatever guna, whatever sin he has he had committed, transgression, acts of transgression he may have committed between both umrahs, the second umrah will expiate, it will wipe out all those sins. All the guna would have been wiped out, forgiven due to the barakat of this second umrah. And if he performs, she performs another umrah later on in life, then that umrah will do the same. وَالْحَجُّ الْمَبْرُورِ لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ The Prophet ﷺ says that a hajj al-mabrur, a, a, a hajj of piety, a hajj that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, its reward is nothing but jannah. Its reward is nothing but jannah. Jannah, paradise, heaven is the reward of such a hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be taking you to such a, to such a hajj. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all a hajj a hajj mabrur a hajj that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tabi'u bayna al-hajj wal umrah. Perform hajj and umrah in succession. Tabi'u mutaba'at, to do one after the other. So do perform hajj and umrah in succession. In other words, don't suffice with just one hajj in your life. Don't suffice with just a single umrah in your life. Try and do as many hajj as possible and as many umrah as possible. Also another well-known hadith that has been reported by Imams Bukhari and Muslim rahimahumullah ta'ala in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said inna umratan fi ramadhan ta'adilu hajjatan an umrah performed during Ramadan is equal to a hajj yeah. and according to another narration the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported as saying an umrah performed during Ramadan is equal to a hajj with me a hajj with me so this is how virtuous it is also, as we shall see inshallah later, regarding a person who does not perform hajj, Shah Waliullah rahimahullah ta'ala mentions a hadith here, a person upon, upon whom hajj is fard, hajj is obligatory, he or she does not go for hajj. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man malaka zadan wa rahilatan tuballighuhu ila baytillah. He who possesses Zadan provision, Tosha, Zad min Tosha, provision, money, Warahilatan, 
and the means of transportation, sawari, rahila means sawari, means of transportation, which will, which will take him to the house of Allah. He who has the provision and he has the means of transportation, which will take him to the house of Allah. Walam yahujja, but he does not go to the house of Allah and perform hajj. He does not go for hajj. فَلَا عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَمُوتَ يَهُودِيًّا أَوْ نَصْرَانِيًّا The Prophet ﷺ said that it does not matter, it is all the same whether he dies a Yahudi, a Jew or a Christian. And this is one of the strongest warnings from the Prophet ﷺ regarding a person who neglects their further duty of Hajj. That they, Hajj has be, had become further on them. And despite Hajj becoming farth on them, they do not go for Hajj. Then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying that فَلَا عَلَيْهِ يَمُوتَ يَهُودِيًا أَوْ نَصْرَانِيًا That مُجَهِ كُوِي بَرْوَانِ يُسْبَرْ كُوِي There's no problem with as to whether he dies a Jew or a Christian. And this is this is the, uh, how, how strong these words are from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That if you neglect your duty of Hajj, then you might as well die, as if he is saying you might as well die a Christian or a Jew. Although the ulama say that if a person neglects the further duty of Hajj, they do not go for Hajj, then that person will not become a Christian or a Jew automatically. He won't. Unless, of course, that person, that person ref, uh, rejects the fardiyat, the obligatoriness, the obligation of Hajj. If they, if they reject it, if a person says that I don't believe Hajj, is fard in Islam, then that person will automatically become a kafir. May Allah save us all. But if a person neglects it, just as if a person neglects five times daily salat, they don't pray five times a day, then that person does not become a kafir. But if that person rejects salat from the deen, they say salat is not part of the deen. Five times namaz, I don't believe in it then that person will become a kafir. Just as the, similarly with fasting during Ramadan and similarly with zakat. Another hadith that Imam Shawuliullah ta'ala mentions here is someone asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mal hajj O Messenger of Allah what is the haji? What, who really is the haji? The real haji? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Ashaithu Tafil. Ashaithu Tafil. Now, Ashaithu Tafil means, Shaith means a person who is covered in dust. Shaith means a person who is covered in dust due to not doing ghusl, due to not having a shower, not bathing, having a bath. A person who is covered in dust, you know, male kuchel, that person is called Shaith. And whose hair is all disheveled. His hair is all disheveled. Bikrehuya bal. So he's covered in dust. He's dirty. Not dirty in that he has najasat on him, impurity on him, but he's covered in dust. He's, has, he's soiled, his clothes are soiled, his body is all dirty, covered in dust. His hair is all disheveled due to not combing and oiling. That person is called a shaith in Arabic. And a tafil means a person who does not smell nice. He has not been or she has not been using perfume. And due to not using perfume, that person does not smell very nice. The, look at this, how the Prophet is, is describing a true haji. Because the person, the sahabi asked, Mal haj, who is the haji, O Messenger of Allah? Who is the real haji? The Prophet says, what is the, the true quality of a true haji, characteristic or trait of a true haji? The Prophet is saying, Ashaithu Tafil. A person who is covered in dust, his hair is, is disheveled and he does not really he does not smell of perfume. Then the person asked, Ayyul Hajji Afdalu. We we'll just continue. Ayyul Hajji Afdalu, what is the best Hajj? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Ajju wa Thajju. Al-Ajju wa Thajju. Al-Ajj means to raise your voice by, with the talbiyah. 
Then that will be as labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka wal mulk la sharika lak. To raise your voice with the talbiyah. When you say the talbiyah, say it loudly. The, the men should say it loudly at all times. Women should say it loud enough to, for, for, for them to hear themselves. A woman should say it loud enough so that she hears it herself, but she, at all times she is commanded by the sharia to make sure that her voice does not reach the ears of a ghair mahram male. Okay? A male who, who, to whom, whom she can marry. In, uh, theoretically. Theoretically a man whom she can marry, get married to. That person is called a ghair mahram. So she is not allowed to raise her voice. Her voice should not reach the ears, ears of such a man. This, is, this should be the, the level of audibility or loudness of her talbiyah. So the Prophet wasallam said, when he was asked, Ayyul Hajj Abdul, which Hajj is the best? The Prophet wasallam said, al ajju wa thajju. So Hajj means to raise your voice in saying the talbiyah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Wa thajju. What the word thaj means to salanu dima'il hadi to shed blood to shed blood of the animal the hadi animal that you'll be slaughtering sacrificing on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah or after the 10th of Dhul Hijjah in your hajj a description and the details of which inshallah we shall look at when we start looking at the laws of hajj the do's and don'ts of hajj and the method of hajj so that is called wasaj asaj then the Prophet Wasallam was asked, Mas Sabil. What is Sabil? And this is a reference by the Sahabi to the words of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حَجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا So Hajj is a duty that men, insan, owe to Allah Ta'ala Manistata'a ilayhi sabila, which people, those people who had, who have, who have the capability, the capacity of the sabil. So the Sahab is asking, O oh Messenger of Allah, what is the sabil? Sabil, the word sabil linguistically in, in the dictionary, the word sabil in Arabic means rasta. Sabil means rasta, path. So what does the sabil, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean by the word sabil? The Prophet ﷺ replied, Zadun wa rahilatun. Provision, tosha wa rahila, and the sawari, means of transportation. So whoever has the provision, the financial means, and whoever has the a means of transportation to go for hajj, then this is this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has implied when he said, Man istata'a ilayhi sabila. And that's a hadith that has been reported in the Sharh al-Sunnah by Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Waliullah rahimahullah ta'ala in closing this, this section of his book he says that the condition of the haji should be that he says ay yudhallila nafsahu lillah ke wo apne aap ko Allah ke waste zalil kar de apne aap ko Allah ke waste Allah ke liye Allah ki raza ke liye apne aap ko zalil kar dale that he he uh, humbles himself he belittles himself humbles himself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he makes himself very lowly. Zalil. Zalil means to disgrace oneself. To disgrace oneself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't, when we go for hajj, we do not think of my shan. That, oh, I'm Mr. So-and-so. I'm a millionaire, I'm a billionaire, I'm a king, I'm a prince. No. When you go for hajj, you, hajj is an expression of the extreme servitude of the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Intahai bandigi. It's an expression of your extreme lowliness, humbleness, your, 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 your being a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not question the, the manasik of hajj. We do not question the wisdoms behind the different rituals that we'll be doing in hajj. We don't question them. Why does Allah ta'ala order us to, to, to take, uh, remove our clothes and instead of our everyday clothes that we're wearing, for men, we are wearing two, ga- two, uh, two uh, sheets of cloth of ihram. We don't question those things. Why does Allah Ta'ala ask us to go round this cubic house seven times? Why does Allah Ta'ala command us to run between these two mounts, mountains of Safa and Marwa? Why does Allah Ta'ala tell us to go on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, Yawmut Tarwiyah, to Mina, 
and spend the, the remaining days and nights there. And then the next day, on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, to go to Arafat and spend the day in Arafat until sunset. And then after the sun has set, to leave Arafat and to come to Muzdalifa, leave it. To come to Muzdalifa and spend the night in Muzdalifa. And then after Muzdalifa in the, in the morning of the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, to come back to Mina. And then to slaughter an animal, to shave our heads or cut our hair. And then to do the tawaf of the house of Allah Ta'ala, the tawaf of ziyara, which is the third tawaf of hajj, the main tawaf of hajj. So why does Allah Ta'ala give us these commandments? What's the logic behind this? What's the reason behind this? We don't question this. So by doing so, we are completely submitting ourselves, surrendering ourselves, subjugating ourselves. And completely, it is as if we're disgracing ourselves in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So this is what the, the condition of the haji should be. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu has commanded us that a haji remains dusty, covered in dust, with disheveled hair, and without any perfume. You're not allowed to, uh, to wear perfume anyway in the state of ihram. It will violate your ihram. And in hajj, people are raising the kalima, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are elevating the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are following the sunnah, the way of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we are remembering the blessings, the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Shawulullah rahmullah ta'ala says these things. He says a lot more. The, the chapter is quite long. I will not go into that. And then also in the second half of his book. He also, there's also another section on Hajj and the, the, the inner dimensions of Hajj, the secrets of Hajj. Shaykh al-Hadith Mawlana Muhammad Zakariya rahimahullah ta'ala also does the same in this book. He goes into a lot of detail of Hajj, the virtues of Hajj and the, the warnings that have been issued by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for those people upon whom Hajj is fard. And they neglect this further duty of Hajj. Inshallah, tomorrow I will carry on. I will say a few things, Inshallah, from the the, the book Virtues of Hajj, Fadaila Hajj of Shaykh al Hadith Mulana Muhammad Zakariya, Rahimullah Ta'ala. And then after that, uh, I shall, will begin looking at what Mullah Ali al Qari, Rahimullah Ta'ala, said regarding Hajj, the conditions of Hajj that must be met, etc., in, in detail, Inshallah, tomorrow. And as I've said at the beginning, inshallah, on Monday, on Monday we will begin our actual preparation for Hajj. And we'll, inshallah, I'll talk, through, uh, talk you through your preparation, the things you must do before you set up for your Hajj. And, also, and, and, and then on, from there on, inshallah, we will go through the days of Hajj. The first day of Hajj, second day, 8th of Dhul Hijjah, the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, 10th of Dhul Hijjah, 11th of Dhul Hijjah, and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. These are the main days of Hajj. Hajj consists of five days. The 13th of Dhul Hijjah is an optional day. If a person wants to either remain in Mina for the 13th of Dhul Hijjah and pelt all, the, all three Jamarat, all three sh- Shaitans as we call them, then he may do so. That is a Sunnah, that is rewardable, that is advisable. If a person wants to leave Mina on the 12th of Dhul Hijjah and return to Makkah Mukarramah, they want to return to the hotel in Makkah, then they have full permission from the Sharia to do so. There is nothing wrong in doing so. If a person comes back to the hotel in Makkah Mukarramah or wherever they're staying, and then on the 13th of Dhul Hijjah they wish to return and pelt the Jamarat, all three Jamarat, then they may do so as well. That is also possible to do. But the 13th of Dhul Hijjah, pelting the Jamarat, the three Shaitans, on the 13th of Dhul Hijjah is optional. You're not required to do that. If a person does it, then they will be rewarded for it. For it. And if a person stays in Mina, when the, the vast majority of the Hujjaj would have left Mina and they would have gone back to Makkah Mukarramah on the 12th of Dhul Hijjah, then that, that is also uh, that is allowed to leave. But to stay for the 13th and pelt the free Jamarat on that day is highly rewardable, advisable. It's a sunnah. But it's a sunnah which is optional. You can do it if you want and you can leave it if you want. Uh, so the days of Hajj are five. The sixth day is an optional day. And then most Hujjaj, after that they go, they travel forth to Medina Munawwara, to the city of our Prophet wasallam, And they visit the grave of our Prophet wasallam. And for that, inshallah, I will spend the, the final day, just one, one session, just on Medina Munawwara. Inshallah, I hope I will be able to do. So tomorrow we'll look at what has been stated by Shaykh, Shaykh al-Hadith, rahimahullah ta'ala. Just a few things, inshallah. 
and then we'll begin to look at the conditions etc explained by Mullah Ali Al-Qadi rahimahullah ta'ala and the commentator on his, of his book and from Monday we'll begin the days, actual days of Hajj inshallah from Monday may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq of attending and listening attentively benefiting and also when we go for Hajj, implementing what we learn here and what we learn from the books, inshallah. And may Allah Ta'ala make all of our Hajj a Hajj Mabrur. A Hajj regarding which the Prophet Sallallahu said, لَيْسَ لَهُ جَزَاءٌ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةٌ That the reward of which nothing except Jannah. And that the Haji will return, يَوْمَ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ Just as on the day when his mother gave birth to him. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.